Welcome, Welcome everybody. everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening at the New England Aquarium. We are uh, very excited for this evening's event and to welcome you to our first lecture of the fall series. Um, this was brought to us, to us by uh, the Lowell Institute, which provides generous support uh, for these programs. So we're able to offer them free of charge and welcome you all each season. Also this evening, a special thanks to WGBH Forum Network for filming tonight's lecture and making it available afterwards to share with your friends and family. My name is Megan Jeans and I'm the Director of Conservation here at the New England Aquarium. Uh, we actually are really excited about this particular program tonight with Paul Greenberg, which I'll share in a little bit, um, because it really aligns very nicely with a lot of the work in our mission here at the aquarium. As some of you may know, we have a sustainable seafood program, a uh, number of folks here in the audience from that program as well, where we work with a lot of different folks to advance the sustainability of both wild capture fisheries and aquaculture operations, working through markets and partnering with major seafood buying companies to work with them on their procurement decisions, working with chefs and restaurants around the region and consumers like all of you to help make informed choices that will ultimately drive the sustainability of our seafood supply. So this evening, we are welcoming Paul Greenberg, uh, who is the author of the New York Times bestseller, which some of you may have read, called Four Fish, The Future of the Last Wild Food. Four Fish has been published throughout Europe and Asia and was picked by the New York Times, The New Yorker, and Bon Appetit as a notable book in 2010. He's just completed his most recent work, American Catch, The Fight for Our Local Seafood, which he'll be talking about tonight and signing uh, autographed copies in the lobby later on. We're really excited about this because he's in this book, in this lecture this evening, he'll really talk about the disconnect between uh, the both the demand and the supply here in the U.S. relative to actually what we're producing domestically. Most of our seafood, as you may or may not know, um, gets imported. And what are some of the things that we can be looking at to sort of marry our interests in sustainability um, and our interest in supporting local producers? Uh, also joining Paul tonight will be Alex Hay from Max Seafood down in the Cape. Some of you guys who spend any time out there on the Cape may be familiar with Max Seafood, um, but he's also going to be talking from the perspective a little bit of what it's like to be a business owner in the seafood business in New England and trying to reconcile some of those challenges between sourcing local and sourcing sustainable um, and really meeting the demand of the consumers, which uh, may not necessarily reflect the supply that's always out there. Paul, uh, as some of you may know, lectures widely, uh, widely around the country um, at various institutions, uh, Harvard, Yale, the United States Supreme Court, uh, other aquariums like Monterey Bay and whatnot. Um, and he's also the recipient of the James Beard Award for Writing and Literature and the Grantham Prize Award for Special Merit. This year, he begins a three-year Pew Marine Fellowship during which he will launch into his next book, The Omega Principle, The Health of Our Hearts, The Strength of Our Minds, and The Survival of Oceans, all in one little pill. So please welcome us, or welcome Paul, and uh, give him a round of applause. Uh, sorry, before one thing, as you walked in, you might have picked up a survey. Uh, if you don't mind filling that out um, after the presentation, if you have not done so already and handing that in as you leave, that would be of great help to Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Megan. Thank you um, to Michael and to Hannah and to everybody here at the aquarium. It's great to be back here. Um, I will say last time I was here, uh, I was in a sort of smaller conference room. This room is kind of like one of those um, going to school in your pajamas nightmare rooms. So, um, and I've actually, um, so this is part of a series of sym symposia that I'm doing around the country, funded by the Walton Foundation, uh, looking at individual fishing communities. We just did one in Provincetown, another one in Montauk. We'll be going to the Gulf of Mexico, to the West Coast, getting fishermen and aquaculturists into the room with a local audience to try and talk about you know, these very real issues that confront um, our seafood system. But anyway, here I am in the naked pajama room. Um, it's great to be here. I, the, I, 
The anxiety dream I had last night was that I was in this room and my co-presenter was Alan Alda. And, um, and then they lost my PowerPoint and Alan Alda said, you don't need a PowerPoint. So, but I do, so I have one tonight. So anyway, everything's going really well so far. Um, anyway, so the theme of this book, or the, the book is American Catch, and the theme of the talk is, is really about something that I encountered when I um, moved apartments in New York City. So I was a happily or you know, happily miserable bachelor uh, in the West Village um, in Manhattan. Uh, any New Yorkers here? Transplants? Okay, a couple in the room. Actually, anyone a fisherman of any kind? Anyone eat there, back there? Okay, any real fish eaters who eats a lot of fish? Okay, good. So it's fairly fishy room. I just want to get the fishy portion. Anyway, so I lived this miserable bachelor life um, in the West Village, and I used to go fishing a lot. I'm a big fisherman. And, uh, you know, used to carve up tuna in my bathtub, like at a scene out of The Godfather. It was, you know, bachelor bliss. And then, of course, I made the mistake of falling in love. And um, when in New York, when you fall in love, you consider two things. Like, do I really love this person? And what kind of real estate does this represent? Um, so my partner, Esther, um, has an apartment um, all the way downtown. I used to think I lived downtown, but this was, like, really downtown. Um, and it was all the way downtown in a place that... I was to learn was once upon a time New Amsterdam. It was the original fishing village of the United States. So I moved down all the way downtown with this kind of expectation, the hope that I'd sort of be in this sort of old timey kind of situation and it would sort of, you know, preserve in amber a little bit of my bachelor roaming days. But I got there and of course immediately I'm surrounded by like banks and brokerage houses and um, it's extremely depressing. And um, uh, and you know, if you're a writer, banks and brokerage houses don't really appeal um, very much. Um, so I sort of started to figure out, well, what's in this neighborhood for me? So one day I got up before dawn, and I often do because I can't sleep, and I got up before dawn, and I got on my bike, and I decided to head towards the river. And I turned onto a road um, that I was later to learn was once called De Magdepatje, the maiden lane, the place, uh, the road along which Dutch washerwomen would go down to the river to wash their clothes. So I went down to Magdapache and I kept going, and I came across um, De Pearl Street. Pearl, Pearl Street. Um, this is a street that in New Amsterdam days was called Pearl Street because it was once upon a time paved with native oyster shells that were pulled right out of the East River and the surrounding estuary. I kept going, kept going, and at a certain point, the banks and brokerage houses sort of gave up, and I started to see these old Greek revival buildings with hazy stenciling on buildings. You know, Joseph LaRocca and Son Shellfish. Um, uh, slave and sons, um, fish and fresh seafood. I kept going, kept going. I went down to a place called Peck Slip, a huge, huge plaza that was totally in disrepair. And there, in front of me, suddenly, was this, the Fulton Fish Market. It was 2005. Fulton Fish Market was still in full swing. Um, it was gross. It smelled. Um, there were fish all over the place. Um, the, the, the ground sort of stuck to your feet when you walked. Um, rumor had it that the mafia would charge you uh, a significant tariff to move the fish from one side of the street to the other. Um, and I kind of loved it. It was amazing. It was this amazing, vibrant place that still said New York was a waterfront city. And so I decided I was going to sort of make the Fulton Fish Market kind of part of my life. And I was going to make re regular visits to it. And I did make you know, several visits. And then one day I decided what I was going to do is make a complete circumnavigation by bicycle of the entire island of Manhattan. And I went up the west side past um, an area that would have actually been paved over had it not been for fish. Um, striped bass were discovered uh, in the rotting pilings along the west side right around the time that a, pro a project was put in the works called Westway, where they literally would have paved over those pilings. But at, thanks to the um, Environmental Protection Agency, the newly found Environmental Protection Agency, the project was halted and the striped bass were saved, and we never saw that. And now we have a beautiful park that lines the west side of the highway. So anyway, I kept going up past um, New York's last remaining salt marsh. We used to have thousands of acres of salt marsh in New York, and now we just have this one little patch. And I went down and down the East River underneath what I kind of imagine as the triple necklaces of New York, the Williamsburg, the Manhattan Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. And I finally came to the Fulton Fish Market, and this is what I found. It was gone. 2005, Fulton Fish Market, once and for all, was shut down um, and moved to the Bronx. Um, and uh, this is something the Giuliani administration had been trying to do. Everybody been trying to get rid of it, the Fulton Fish Market. In fact, New York used to have 14 waterfront markets, and this was the last one. The fish market, the fishmongers held on for dear life year after year after year. But finally, they got moved out, and they had all actually signed a document saying they would never return to Fulton to sell fish ever again. And I remember I went up to the new uh, Fulton Fish Market 
Um, and I said, you know, these big Italian guys who, in the old Fulton market, kind of hung over you like giants. Um, in the new Fulton market, they look like they're this tall. It's this giant sort of airplane hangar. And it's, you know, yeah, it's more efficient. It's, it's, it's temperature controlled and everything. But something is definitely lost. And I, I said to one of the fishmongers, I said, how do you feel about being up here in the Bronx? And he said, you know where they put us? Right here. So it's the real Bronx salute. Um, it's also around that same time as I started to look into the sort of fish situation in this country that I came across a kind of startling statistic. That the United States controls more ocean than any country on Earth, something like 2.8 billion acres of ocean. Um, pretty amazing. Um, number two is France, by the way. Sort of interesting. Um, but in spite of that, uh, more than 80% of our seafood comes to us from abroad. Sometimes, it's, sometimes Noah says it's 91%, sometimes they say 85%, but it's a lot. Um, and I remember when I was up at the old Bronx fish market, I was um, meeting with this guy. I, I, I met finally Herb Slavin, who was one of the great Pashas of the old market. Um, and I said to him, Herb, how do you feel about the fact that you know, more than 80% of the seafood that we are eating is coming to us from abroad? And without missing a beat, he looks at me and he goes, who's abroad? <laughs> And I was like, what? And he's like, who's the broad, the lady with all the fish? Who is she? Um, and I suddenly realized that this was the theme for my new book, Who's the Broad? Who is the broad? Um, why is it that we have control of this ocean? And why is it that so much of it is imported? So just a cursory glance at things. And I'm going to say that um, I'm going to try and go through this presentation a little quickly uh, so that we can get to talk with Alex and, and see what some of the things that he's confronting. But <coughs> very briefly, these are the top six most consumed seafoods in America. Um, shrimp, 90% imported, um, a lot of it coming to us from Asia or South America, a lot of it farmed. Um, canned tuna, uh, one of the things that launched canned tuna actually into the marketplace was the American occupation of Japan. Douglas MacArthur, seeing the suffering of the Japanese people after the war, uh, allowed them to rebuild an overseas fleet, and they were one of the spearheads that launched the international tuna industry. So now, number two most consumed seafood in America, canned tuna, a lot of it coming to us from abroad. Number three, salmon. You would think, salmon, that should, we should have a lot of, and we do. I mean, we used to actually have salmon in Massachusetts and Connecticut, Maine, um, the first Atlantic salmon of the year that used to be presented to the president from the state of Maine no longer happens, but once upon a time we had viable uh, salmon in this area. But anyway, we still have very big runs of salmon in Alaska, but something like 80% of the salmon that we catch in this country is exported. Um, meanwhile, that two-thirds of the salmon that we actually eat, we Americans, is farmed. So we have our salmon going abroad, and granted it's different species, some would argue lower quality than the farm stuff that we're getting in, and your, your description of what is, what is high quality and what's low quality sort of depends on your perspective. But in any case, two thirds of the salmon that we eat coming to us from abroad, mostly farmed. Um, and then there's an, a sort of other odd aspect to this whole thing is that a certain portion of the salmon that we catch in this country, we catch here in America, catch it in Alaska, we freeze it, we send it to China or elsewhere in Asia, we defrost it, bone it, or they defrost it, bone it, refreeze it, and then it comes back to us, double frozen. So we don't actually know. It's kind of hard to tease out of that 85% of the seafood that we eat is imported, how much of it is actually our seafood, but a lot of it is. Um, that brings us to number four, Alaska pollock. Alaska pollock is now the thing in your filet of fish sandwich. It used to be Atlantic cod, but now it's generally Alaska pollock. Um, again, 600 million pounds of Alaska pollock <clears throat> exported every year. A certain portion of it goes to Germany, to Holland, is transformed into surimi which is then put into your California roll. That's the fake crab that if you fans of Curb Your Enthusiasm, I think Larry David's marriage and that show broke up because during sex he would complain about fake crab. Um, that fake crab is, is probably Pollock most of the time. Um, number five um, is tilapia. Again, um, this is a, what, you know, in the last 30, 40 years, there's emerged this concept of what's called the whitefish industry, just sort of white neutrally uh, tasting things. Um, cod was the original white fish, but other fish have now kind of been slotted in. And to me, this is the um, this is the thing that really captures what's going on. Ah, the Glo Gloucester fisherman, uh, he's at his ship and he's bringing home some tilapia from the George's Bank. Well, of course, no, tilapia is not from the George's Bank. It's a freshwater fish. It grows very fast from egg to an adult in about nine months, um, coming to us mostly from China. Um, so, you know, 
that's that's the state of it. Um, and then number six is Pangasius catfish. And Pangasius catfish is one of those fish that you don't even know that you're eating, but you might be eating it. Um, if you go to a hospital, for example, and the orderly comes in and says, what would you like, so chicken or fish? And you say, what's the fish? And the orderly say, I don't know. It's just fish. So oftentimes that's Pangasius catfish. Again, a very fast-growing fish, goes very quickly from egg to adult, um, can live very, very densely, and actually, they're packed in so tightly that sometimes the ponds um, go anoxic, or not completely anoxic, but they lose a lot of oxygen. And at that point, Pangasius catfish can stick their faces above the water and take a breath of air. They are air-breathing fish. So um, those are our top six. Um, so where did this happen? What, what went wrong? What's, why is this, or maybe it went right, what changed? Um, well, I can't speak for all the seafood industry because everything's a little different. I mean, I think one thing that's exciting about fish and seafood, it's not like the boring thing of going to um, the meat counter where you're choosing between basically you know, four hoofed mammals and four birds. When you go to a fish counter, you're really looking at the state of the ocean. But there are certain signals and noises that you tease out when you look at this. And perhaps one of the biggest signals that I have seen in terms of the way that the seafood economy in this country has changed um, is oysters. And so this is right underneath, I think that's the Manhattan Bridge, but that's one of the many oyster um, houses that used to line the East River. Um, the average New Yorker, uh, as recently as 100 years ago, ate 600 local New York City oysters per person per year. Um, there were varietals of oysters that were reflected in the local economy and the local names. There used to be a Gowanus oyster, and uh, those of you from New York may know that the Gowanus Canal is now a Superfund site, but there was a once upon a time Gowanus oyster. Well, Many things conspired to destroy the New York oyster and the oyster industry in general. Um, the New York oyster beds, which used to number in the trillions, um, were mined out by about the 1820s. But that didn't stop a very viable oyster farming industry from cropping up. And at one point, oysters were just really, really central uh, to the oyster, I mean, to the seafood economy of this country. But that's changed. And you know, if you look at this graph, I was told that the slide didn't come out too well. But this is just Xerox from a book called "From Oystering from Boston to New York." But you can see. Just the incredible drop-off of oysters that happens uh, in the 20s and 30s. Um, we used to have, you know, we used to eat about as many oysters per person per year as now we eat shrimp. And shrimp is the number one most consumed seafood in this country. What does that represent? Well, it represents that we once trusted our estuaries. We once trusted the waters next door to be clean enough to feed us. But once we started kind of moving in the direction of thinking of our estuaries as something else, places where you dump your uh, organic waste, places where you dump your industrial waste, places where you might, if you, even if you're not doing one or the other, maybe you're building some vacation houses. One thing after another led to this tremendous decline to the point where, in addition to the decline of the um, uh, wild oysters, which are now 80% um, decreased from what they used to be, we now have an oyster industry that's about 14% capacity. Now, it was at about 1% of historical capacity before the Clean Water Act. But thanks to the Clean Water Act, we've actually started to see an uptick in oysters again. Um, and if you read the book American Catch by the author here, um, you'll read about stuff like this, which is this is a tire um, in the Bronx in Soundview. Um, and it's funny, this is the site of an oyster restoration project. There's actually just recently launched this thing called the Billion Oyster Project in New York City. And I understand they're trying to, thinking about trying to do something like that here in Boston as well. But the idea is to get a billion oysters into New York Harbor and the greater New York by, by 2025. Um, what's, what's interesting about this picture is that they've got all these man-made structures that they're trying to figure out that to try and get oysters to set once again in New York. Meanwhile, the thing they love most is radial tires. So, of course, you can't dump radial tires into the New York Bight. That's illegal at this point. But it's interesting to see what's happening. So, overall, though, what you see is this. You know, you see a huge decline in oysters and a huge, huge rise in shrimp. You know, you talk about signal and noise. This, to me, is the clearest signal, the replacement of oysters with shrimp. To the point where this kind of represents, this equation kind of represents the American seafood diet right now. We eat um, about four pounds of, sea, of shrimp per person per year, and that's roughly equal to the next two most popular seafoods combined, um, salmon and tuna. So a huge, huge shift. So what is this thing called shrimp? Well, it's the next thing in the book. Um, and that's, you know, I, I sort of organized the book around these three, three creatures, uh, oysters, shrimp, and salmon. But um, <clears throat> with shrimp, uh, shrimp often are very 
deeply interconnected um, with salt marshes and with the near shore. They use salt marshes near shore, not all shrimp species, but the shrimp species that sort of we're familiar with in this country require salt marshes. Um, this shrimp actually, in particular, um, this is called Macrobrachium ohione. And it's a really interesting shrimp. It actually used to be the shrimp of Cajun country. It's a freshwater shrimp, and what it actually does, instead of migrating out to sea, it migrates up the Mississippi River. And it used to be the shrimp went all the way up to the Ohio River. And this was the shrimp that people used to eat in Louisiana when you thought about, well, this shrimp is now, used to be in the trillions, probably now it's in the billions. There's still many of them, but it's no longer a commercial entity. And why? Most because of this. Um, what we've done to a huge portion of our deltaic areas and our wetlands is convert them from seafood systems into land food systems. The growing of corn has required us to channelize the Mississippi, make it flow much faster, doing things like this, where they, um, this is called the Greenville Bends, where um, in the 1820s after the, or 1920s after the Great Flood um, in the Mississippi, they literally cut off these oxbows that would allow the river to meander, create great habitat for things like shrimp. But all that went away. And this is not just in Mississippi. Overall, we've lost something like 60% of our wetlands in this country, 60 to 70% of our salt marsh. Surprise, 70% of commercial seafood species require some time at least in a salt marsh to survive. So we've literally been digging out and destroying our seafood infrastructure um, all throughout our country. Um, George Washington was actually a big fan of draining salt marshes. He had a, a, a land speculation company built entirely on draining salt marsh. And so you do this kind of thing enough, and you get this phenomenon. So this is um, uh, the Mississippi Delta. And the Mississippi Delta right now is disappearing at a rate of about a football field of land an hour. Um, this is a tremendously productive system, tremendously important for things like shrimp, for things like black drum, for red drum, uh, for all these kind of classic Gulf seafoods that you imagine. It's literally disappearing. But we're not, necess not necessarily noticing it. And why? Because of an incredible biotech revolution that has occurred uh, in the last few years, or last, I would say, four to five decades. Some people call it the blue revolution, but the rise of international aquaculture has really changed the sh face of seafood as we know it. Um, these two guys are considered the f some of the founders of modern shrimp farming. Um, uh, I think uh, it's uh, Fujinaga, who's sort of considered the real grandfather, and he actually was the first person um, to really effectively domesticate to close what's called closing life cycle on a shrimp. Um, the shrimp that he used was something called the Karuma prawn, and it was a shrimp that was initially used in a dish called dancing shrimp. Um, in dancing shrimp, what you do is you take a live shrimp, you rip off its carapace while it's still alive, dunk it in sake, and pop it in your mouth. And um, that, uh, you know, you obviously need to have some live fresh shrimp. And, Dr. Fujinaga figured that Kuruma prawns at the time were selling for about 100 bucks a pound in, that, in those days' currency. Um, and so he figured this was probably a good bet to try to domesticate, and he did. Um, following the domestication of the Kuruma prawn, though, many other species came online. First, you had the tiger prawn, uh, then the uh, Pacific white leg shrimp. Um, one by one, several different species have come to be domesticated, although probably 80% of the shrimp that we eat today is Pacific White Lake because it takes particularly well to aquaculture. Well, in some ways it's been a very good thing because we're able to get this very fast growing, cheap source of protein. You can, hot countries can grow two, sometimes three crops of shrimp per year. So in that sense, it's very efficient. On the other hand, there are very real environmental consequences. So this is a mangrove forest and it's kind of like the Asian tropical equivalent of a, a salt marsh. Um, mangrove forests are extremely important for the production of seafood, um, they're very important for coastal uh, flood protection. They're very important for the uh, controlling of nutrients that come into the watershed. Um, and this is what a, a mangrove forest should look like. This is in Vietnam near the town of Tam that I visited a few years ago. This is what it should look like. Unfortunately, a lot of places that have been host to shrimp farms now look like this. Now, granted, there have been strides made in Asian countries to try and s stop the spread of uh, the sort of rampant spread of shrimp ponds that happened in the early days. In the early days, you would get um, shrimp diseases, uh, white spot, yellow head, different kinds of diseases that came around, would cause uh, shrimp ponds to be infected. The only solution sometimes was just to abandon the pond and dig another one. And so this sort of daisy chain effect happened with shrimp pond after shrimp pond after shrimp pond being redone. Um, places like Vietnam are involved in a very significant mangrove forest reforestation project, but nevertheless, mangrove forests are suffering, and shrimp are a, a very a significant part of it. Um, 
just shrimp processing in Vietnam that I saw a few years ago. And that's one of the many shrimp diseases that you're likely to see crop up. This is called white spot. And just recently, we had a new disease that appeared called early mortality syndrome. Um, it's a disease nobody saw, has really seen before. It started in China, and then it spread due to probably poor biosecurity from farm to farm to the point where the Thai shrimp industry, I think, lost over a billion dollars in crop in the last year. Um, there's talk of the disease being contained, but these kinds of things happen when you involve um, animal husbandry on a very large scale. So overall, you can just see this pattern of um, imports really coming into our country um, at a really greater and greater rate. Um, and you know, I would say overall what it reflects is kind of, and what's relevant to here in, in Boston, is overall, again, another signal versus the noise, it's the decline of the Atlantic and the rise of the Pacific in all ways. Um, all of these creatures that you see here are mostly aquacultured fish except for tuna and, um, and pollock. But what's not included in the graph here is the huge amount um, that Alaska pollock plays in our seafood diet. And it doesn't, if you put Alaska pollock and say Boston or Massachusetts cod on the same scale, it's really hard because you can't, the order of magnitude more pollock that we're using for our whitefish compared to the amount of cod we have left in the east, it's really, really staggering. So overall, though, you just see imports going up and up and up. Now, the next fish, or the last fish, that I looked at in the book was salmon. And um, I just, just a snapshot here of some of the more popular salmon species that you're likely to see, um, the Atlantic species being the only one that we have here in the Atlantic. And these fish used to, once upon a time, in great numbers, migrate to uh, Greenland and to Iceland. Um, but at a certain point, right after the Second World War, and I should say, one of the other things that's sort of gotten us into our present predicament is that since World War II, um, countries have made a real big push to control more ocean. Um, after World War II, people started to realize that controlling ocean was a national security issue. And so if you owned more ocean, you had more self-defense. Um, First countries to really start to declare the ownership of more oceans were Chile and Peru, but then the United States came on board in 1976 and extended what's called their EEZ, their Exclusive Economic Zone, out to 200 miles. And, well, you know, when you do that, um, I think probably there must have been a discussion uh, when they extended that um, EEZ out. Probably somebody said to the president at the time, how are we going to police all of that extra ocean? And somebody, I'm sure, said, how about fishermen? So, after we start controlling all this more, oh, so much more ocean, we start subsidizing fishing in a way we never did before. The ability to amortize a vessel becomes much more quick. Um, you can get fuel subsidies, and that's why we see this tremendous swelling of the American fishing fleet starting in about the early 70s, going on until about, um, I'd say, the early 90s. And a lot of the overfishing that we've experienced has been in part because of that swelling up and because of, in part fishermen have been used to play a national security role when really they're just meant to be fishermen. So anyway, getting back to salmon though, all countries expanded their fishing efforts after World War II and salmon were hit particularly hard because those two places that you can see where salmon converged to forage were actually discovered uh, in the post-war period and mixed stocks of salmon were fished really hard. Um, and we saw a precipitous decline in Atlantic salmon. The other thing going on is, um, so this is my home state of Connecticut, um, and uh, it looks like it has the measles, and in a way it does. Um, each spot on that map uh, is a dam. There are over 3,000 dams in the state of Connecticut alone, and uh, nationally, um, just thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dams, and all of those dams interrupt the flow of energy between land and sea. It's a huge national problem uh, and something that we're really going to have to reckon with. Well, not every place is overrun with dams. And this is Bristol Bay, Alaska, which is the subject of the third part of the book. Bristol Bay, Alaska is site to probably the greatest sockeye salmon run left in the world. Over 40 million fish come into the system. And there's so many salmon that come in that when you go fishing, there, people don't really actually fish for the sockeye salmon because it's kind of, there's too many of them. Uh, what they like to fish for is rainbow trout. And when you fish for rainbow trout in Bristol Bay, this is what you use. It's called a flesh fly. Um, it, most flies, you know, who's a, anybody a trout fisherman here? Fish with dry flies ever? So, you know, when you're a trout fisherman, you're, you're trying to match the hatch. You know, you try and match the insect that's rising off the stream. Well, in Alaska, you're just matching a chunk of flesh that fell off the body of a rotting salmon. That's how many salmon there are. And on one of these flesh flies, here's a fish that I caught um, in Bristol Bay. And this is a you know, big, big old rainbow trout, just caught right off the dock, 
blazing power, swimming like crazy against 10 knot current. Um, and this fish, I just throw this in here because it shows you the energy in the system. Because the guy tries to pose for a picture and it slips out of his hand, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. Um, and then, you know, finally, when he actually got the, uh, control of the fish, he slipped it down in the water and just shot away upstream. That's how much energy is in the system. And it's enough energy to fuel these tremendous uh, commercial fisheries, very diverse uh, commercial fishery where you have all sorts of small boats, some big boats, but really, really diverse and very handsome fishermen fishing under rainbows. Um, it's really great. Now, this, is a, um, and this is a group called the Ilium and the Fish Company, and they have what's called a CSF, a community supported fishery. And you can actually buy a share in their fishery, and you get a year's supply of salmon when they come back and shave their beards and move back to Brooklyn and Portland and sell you their fish directly. Um, well, all of these great fisheries are under threat right now because, as I say, you look at Bristol Bay, Alaska, it's a beautiful spot. Um, you know, again, a lot of the salmon being caught there is not being caught, but is not being uh, handled and sent to you in Brooklyn or Portland or, or, or Boston. A lot of it is going abroad. There's a weird disconnect, I think, as a result of that because the so much is dependent on export. I, I have this sense, and it's not entirely provable, but this sense that in some way, it's all just widgets moving around. And so in this bay where all this tremendous wild fisheries are going on, um, where there's no, not really a dam to be seen, this is what's on the books. So uh, Bristol Bay is the site of a proposed copper and gold mine that would require um, the storage on site of 10 billion tons of mining tailings. Um, there's, um, the, the, the tailings are largely sulfurous. It's, in fact, somebody who flew me over the site once said that if you were to call it by what it really is, it's, it's really not a, um, a copper mine, it's a sulfur mine. Um, it's all in an earthquake area, by the way. Um, so anyway, what's happened in the last few years, though, is that the, for the first time, commercial fishermen and sport fishermen, who are usually at each other's throats, actually got together and tried to stop this thing. Um, and I remember, it was mentioned earlier that I spoke at the Supreme Court. I did speak at the Supreme Court. And it's interesting to see how the corridors of power flow. Um, I always wear my fishing hat whenever I talk. It's mostly to hide the bald spot. But it's also, you know, sort of a security blanket against these naked pajama moments. But I was wearing my hat in the Supreme Court. And this elderly w woman went up to me. And she grabbed my hat. And she said, now, what's this young man? I, s I said, it's my hat. It's my fishing hat. And she scowled at me. And she's like, I, would you like me to take it off? She goes, well, it is the Supreme Court. I said, OK. And I took it off, and she smiled, and she held out her hand, and she said, I'm Sandra. It was Sandra Day O'Connor. Huge fisherman. Huge fisherman. And she didn't want her waters screwed around with. That kind of thing, to me, is what speaks of a certain kind of America that I would like to see, you know, a fishier kind of America. So if there's any sort of overarching political message, draw a red circle around the salmon and stop pebble mine. So, you know. I really just felt that Alaska, to me, was this place that was pure, is pure, has really great fisheries, is a place that really should be part of the national consciousness. And I just thought I'd leave you, you know, before we bring Alex up and we'll have a little more of a conversation about um, what you can do on a local basis, um, I just thought I'd read you a little passage uh, from the end of the book. Um, it's not a spoiler on your thing. It's, you know, it's not that kind of book. It's not a mystery. Um, so. This is, I'm at the Iliamna Fish Company. I'm at this place called Graveyard Point, uh, walking around in the midnight sun. The sun doesn't really set, uh, looking around. So passing up to a bluff, I looked down on the isolated little settlement washed by the foam of the Bering Sea and thought that once upon a time, a little 17th century village called New Amsterdam must have looked quite a bit like this. That picture, by the way, on top is New Amsterdam. The picture on the bottom is uh, Graveyard Point. Um, a village called New Amsterdam must have looked quite a bit like this, a modest place with its face turned toward the sea, where the fishermen and the fishmonger were an integral part of daily life, and where seafood held its own with land food in nearly every regard. What kind of alternative future might America have had if the descendants of New Amsterdam had decided that seafood, not land food, would be the new country's bread and butter? Not a Jeffersonian society that relied upon the harvests of agriculture, nor a Hamiltonian one that kept in banking and industry, but rather a Neptunian democracy that lived off the sea, a place where estuaries were recognized as the heart of the food system, where rivers were rarely fettered for the fear of impending miraculous runs of salmon, sturgeon, shad, and herring, where human development moved in parallel with the protection of the near shore. What kind of society might we have formed had we not, 
as Herman Melville wrote in Moby Dick, become landsmen, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks? What if instead we had become what Melville called a society fixed in ocean reveries? So thank you very much. So Alex, if I could ask you to come up. Um, so I met Alex last year uh, at an event we did in Wellfleet. Um, and Alex is doing really amazing stuff, both in terms of marketing local seafood and really thinking about the local ecology. And uh, rather than just sort of, you know, I always like to say I'm a specialist in the hazy overview, um, but, but Alex is really down in the weeds, uh, so to speak. So I thought it would be interesting to hear a little bit about what you're doing. And when we open up the floor to questions, you know, you can ask me a question, but I'll give you a hazy one. But if you ask Alex a question, he'll give you a concrete one because he actually has to make money off of this. So tell us a little bit about your business. Max Seafood is called, correct? Sure. Um, uh, my brother and I started Max Seafood uh, 20 years ago. Uh, when we were just kids as a, as a, as a summer uh, job, um, basically because we loved uh, fishing and, and living off the, off the bay where we lived on Cape Cod in Truro. And, um, you know, it, we really had an appreciation for, uh, really unknowing, <laughs> unknowing the appreciation for fresh, fresh fish and fresh clams and fresh oysters um, in their natural element. So, sort of long story short, um, 20 years later, we're still trying to do that, but have gone through a tremendous amount of hurdles uh, trying to maintain that quality uh, of the product, maintain the lines of communication with the fishing families that produce these, um, produce these products. Um, and it's been tough because um, not only is it tough just dealing with the same people, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, day in and day out, but, but the ecosystem has changed drastically. Um, we, have, we have now seen almost a complete stop of, uh, not, not a 100% stop, but almost 100% <coughs> almost stop of, of ground fish on the Outer Cape. Ground fish uh, being? Ground fish being uh, cod, haddock, uh, inshore flounders, um, and that was really uh, a mainstay in what we, what we saw as an everyday sort of um, piece of the puzzle that came in day in and day out. That's pretty much dried up um, and really only what's landed in New England wise is really on offshore boats. There, there's, there's still some but it's, it's very few and far between um, and the market is very volatile with it as well. So, so we started 20 years ago and uh, we now have um, four fish markets, three restaurants uh, and a, a large wholesale division. Um, and the wholesale division was started to be able to uh, procure all the product that we use in our restaurants. And, um, and we'll talk more about this, and I hope, in the Q&A too, but um, part of the issue is when you start to agree to get in uh, an, uh, a relationship with a fishing family um, or fishermen or fishing women, you, you don't really have the option to say, okay, today I want 100 pounds of this or I want 10 pounds of this. You take everything they catch that day, and someday it might be really rough out, and you only get they only land, you know, a couple hundred pounds of lobsters. But someday they go out and they catch 2,500 pounds of lobster, and I can't use 2,500 pounds of lobster in in a single day. So I have to find markets to take my overage, and this is really right there is the crutch of the problem of the dilemma of the local seafood and where does it go and why aren't we eating more products. Um, that coupled with the other guy who goes fishing for butterfish or hake or mackerel uh, or dogfish uh, or skate wings or monk, um, which are, you know, we're, we're finally seeing monk really catch on in the last few years. <coughs> Excuse me, but, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have not seen dogfish in a market yet um, because it just really is, is, is tough to come by and tough to put on to the consumer at this point. So. I, I spend most of my day now buying and selling seafood um, in the retail markets and in the restaurant and in the uh, and in the, the basically the national market, primarily on the shellfish side with oysters, clams, lobsters, uh, live sea scallops, and scallop meats. And um, again, to go back to the challenge of when you know some days I do need 100 pounds you know for my markets, but I might not be able to use the three three or four thousand pounds. That's really what's at the 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 core of the problem of where does our local catch really go from my point of view um, and where where we are now. 
And also, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the oysters on the cave. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the um, potential benefits that oysters have in, in their magnificent power of filtering so much water uh, on a daily basis, um, which some say could be up to 50 to 55 gallons a day per each oyster. Uh, in that, they're filtering out all of these nutrients that um, are the result of what we're putting into the estuaries via uh, septic systems or fertilizers or sewage treatment plants. Um, so what I'm actually the chair of the wastewater committee in, in Wellfleet, and uh, we have um, been sort of following in some of the pioneers' footsteps uh, who are looking at the advantages of using oysters to help remediate nitrogen and, and uh, nutrient problems in estuaries by building uh, what Paul showed about um, artificial reefs, um, or in the case of Wellfleet, where we're, we're sort of blessed with some of the few remaining um, actual oyster, wild oyster reefs, to refurbish those reefs by putting, um, by putting on substrate, not, not like tires, but <laughs> we use crushed clam shells uh, around in certain areas, so when the oysters do spawn, they adhere to these substrates. And what that does is create these oyster reefs, which basically, in effect, creates these giant filters in the harbor. And when this uh, water with high in nutrients come in there, these oysters filter out all that water and take the nutrients, convert it into shell and meats and grow, and so they can produce more. So the result, the result is we have cleaner water and more oysters in our harbor. And, so, and, and more habitat. I mean, and more habitat for the ecosystem services are tremendous for all the little baby fish that are coming up there, um, what you name it, it's, it's coming through there. So. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I thought that um, Alex and what they're doing out there is really, I think, a lot of times fishermen are looked at as kind of destroyers of the ecosystem and the fish business as, you know, this, this way that we're sort of depleting things. But at the end of the day, one thing that always occurs to me is that Yes, marine scientists send, spend time out on the water, um, but it's really fishermen that are out on the water on a very daily basis. And it's fishermen who often notice things and who notice key changes in the ecosystem, like loss of oyster reefs and that effect. Um, so I think, you know, it, going forward, we have to figure out some kind of balance between the fishing industry and maintaining working waterfronts and maintaining a healthy environment, which is kind of what motivated me to write the book. But why don't we open up to questions rather than us going on and on? Yes, in the back. So a couple of years ago, uh, and if you could speak up just a little bit. Sure. A couple of years ago, uh, a um, new supported fishery was uh, created up on the North Shore in Boston. And uh, I didn't uh, get a share of a coworker of mine at the Mass Department of Fishing Game got a share. And so he started getting deliveries from this uh, new supported fishery. And he got an enormous amount of cod, which made him very Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can, um, I, one of the reasons this year we, we completely stopped buying from local cod fishermen, uh, primarily cod and haddock fishermen, was for exactly that reason. Um, there are some still some fish out there. Now, we really need to be more vocal about um, making sure that the last ones aren't caught. So when you get put in a position like that, I, I think that um, it's, 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 a t it's a very tough one. But that's what I was trying to say before about how there, there are still some cod and haddock out there. Now, there's a lot of regulations and permits quotas that are out there so they can catch these things. In fact, we had a, we, there was a great um, catch of haddock this spring and, and early summer this year. But we sort of have to, you sort of have to restrain yourself from getting involved in those fisheries because if, if you're not going to do it, uh, someone else is just going to continue to do it and, and they're just going to go and do that and put it in your fish share and, and, and nothing will be done about it. Now, um, I think for us, we, you know, we had to take a stand at some point. And even though you're, you're, you're trying to support your neighbor, at the same time, um, he's going to go out and deplete the fish for the future generations. So um, it's, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy answer to that at all. Um, however, I do think that um, we need to, we need to, you need to really lobby the, the guys making the rules and, and sit in those meetings and listen to it because it's, it's a very laborious process, process. But if we don't say anything, then it's just going to continue to go on and go on and go on.
The, the flip side of it, there was a recent paper, and I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the source with me right now, but there was a recent paper, and it was an analysis of community-supported fisheries and sort of how they compare to um, larger fisheries. Um, and one thing that was notable was that a community-supported fishery was much more likely to target um, you know, very abundant species, like things like dogfish, like things like sea robin or something like that, um, because they had the direct customer relationship um, they could potentially convince people to try different things. But I do find it a thorny issue. Um, I think cod might be the thorniest issue of all, of all the you know, things out there. Um, it's not only a problem you know, because th as a targeted species, it's depleted. Um, it's also, you know, even if you're not trying to catch the cod, you often catch the cod. It's just yeah. it's swimming in amongst the other ground fish. And, and, to, and to, to look at that from the side of the fisherman as well, he's got quota to go catch cod. And he's been allotted that quota. So he's not doing anything wrong either. So it makes it even more of a thorny issue as well. Right. Another question out there. In the whole IMAX theater, yes. <laughs> Over, overseas, dogfish is used in primarily in, in, in England and in Europe and, and, uh, as their fish and chips. It's their number one fish. Um, honestly, uh, we have tried uh, to put it in our restaurants and, and in our cases, and um, it, it's not a very palatable fish right now in terms of how it lines up with our current um, sort of texture profiles. We like very uh, flaky, bland, um, primarily white fish uh, that has a little bit of texture, that flaky has some texture. Dogfish doesn't really have that texture. It's more like a sponge texture. Um, we're, I mean, we've been developing uh, with several uh, groups, you know, over the past 10 years to try to get some product that would, that would um, add significant value. Right now, the, the ex vessel price on dogfish hovers below 20 cents a pound. Um, and when, they, when you have a price like that, the fishermen do not treat the fish very well too. So you'll see boats come in in the middle of the summer with most of their catch, not even ice, just sitting on the decks because they don't really care because... Which is particularly important with dogfish. I mean, you have to scan it quickly because yeah. otherwise you get ammonia in the fish. And so, you know, even if they could get an extra nickel if it was a little better, they still don't even worry about that. So they just send it off. So we have this, this problem here and, you know, we started a, a you know, we're a program where we were paying a buck a pound uh, to try to, and there's, and there's several of, of other dealers trying to do this and processors trying to do this to, you know, smaller catches, make sure they're being ice slushed when they're caught. Um, but it's, it's ultimately comes up to the consumer to buy that fish. And when we put this stuff on our, um, when we put these products onto our display cases in our retail markets, where really that's where the rubber meets the road, um, it's, it's a very tough sell. I mean, you really have to convince these people. It's a little bit easier to put it in a fish and chips, but even at that, it's it's still, um, it's they can tell it's something different, you know, and they and they don't know what it is. Do you? I mean, I would imagine. I kind of almost have the impression that in Europe, they've never even really seen eye to eye with a dogfish. It might not even know that it is a shark. Um, it might just be I, a fish to them. Yeah, I mean, all they they don't ever see any whole fish over there. All it goes yeah. right. Most of this goes to New Bedford, and it gets processed entirely. So all they're getting is nice, usually. Um, IQF, uh, individual portion. quick frozen portions. Yeah. I mean, and you know, this process of turning, um, you know, low value fish into high value fish has happened before. Uh, Alaska um, is, you know, anybody ever have um, Copper River salmon or hear of Copper River salmon? So, you know, some recognition here. If you ask, if I ask the same question in Seattle, you know, everyone would go, oh, Copper River salmon. But once upon a time, I, the guy who actually did it for Cottle River it was a guy named John Rowley, who's a commercial fisherman. And he noticed that all the salmon that were being caught out of the Copper River, they just throw the fish in the front of the boat and let them bake in the sun. John, meanwhile, he looked at the length of the river and he saw, geez, wow, this river is really long. These fish are going to need really strong fat reserves. That's a delicious fish. If we could only get people to ice the fish um, and treat them well, we could really raise the value. Now, Copper River. It's like the creme de la creme. And, you know, there's, John every year sends me a photo of the most expensive Copper River salmon he's seen in the markets in Seattle because it's the first nice salmon that comes in. And you're, they're getting $40 a pound, $50 a pound for Copper River Kings. 
Um, I don't know if we'll ever see forty dollars a pound for New Bedford dogfish. Um, <laughs> ways to go. Um, but you know things change, and also you know it's like if you look back through the menus of New York, there's a great project. Um, I'm working with a historical marine ecologist, and she's been going through all all the past menus of New York City. You'll see all these fish on the menus that today people wouldn't really like. Shad, for example, very bony fish, was considered um, you know one of the creme de la creme fish out there. So tastes change. Uh, but how do you make a change is, is, is the question. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. With, you know, the, the fact that we like our fish uh, skinless, boneless, and basically as pale as possible has really ruled out any of these really great fish. You know, mackerel, whole mackerel on the bone, pan seared, um, the shad, um, you know, even herring. Um, all those little fish uh, has it, basically it's, it's a very touch, tough shell. Black sea bass, uh, scup. I mean, some of the best tasting fish that we've ever had, uh, you know, bluefish, fresh bluefish. Um, it's just people don't want it. They want to come in and, uh, you know, I think the, your picture of the tilapia that used to be cod, yeah. that really did it for people in, you know, in the 60s, and now it's, it's a tough sell for really anything else. By the way, uh, scup now, I was just have to do one of these in, in Montauk, Long Island. Now they're calling scup, they're calling it Montauk Sea Bream. Beautiful. So it seems to be moving products, yeah. so you, know, you never know. Another question out there? Yes. Oh, and then this is a question about bluefish. I couldn't find as much bluefish in the markets this summer around Boston as other years. Um, it, is, it, just it was a slow year for bluefish, but um, uh, a little bit slower. But really, I think demand for bluefish was at its weakest I've seen in a long time this year, and who knows what it is. And um, I know the out-of-state market, and again, it goes back to the local catch thing, the out-of-state market is much higher uh, demand for bluefish, uh, particularly in Maryland, where they use it in Maryland for their fish and chips down there. Really? So, they put bluefish in fish and chips? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, there's some, <laughs> yeah, so who know, I mean, who knows where, you know, why it happens that way, but it's just really the market will demand it, and that's where it goes. So, you know, you might just see that skip right over Boston and head out of town. That said, what is interesting about bluefish, um, uh, Carolyn Hall, the marine ecologist, the historical marine ecologist I'm working with, um, who's gone back through a lot of the fishing records, speaks of periods where bluefish vanish entirely, like even in the colonial period, just completely and totally disappear. Um, and um, I remember there's a, one of Edith Wharton's books, there's a description of bluefish as being just this very delicious, princely fish, and clearly you sense the wake of a disappearance in the treasuring of that fish. So, you know, the bluefish are weird, you know, they, they, they disappear. Uh, question over there. Yes. Did everybody hear the question? Oh, so just the question is, there's now these containment-grown shrimp here in this country where they're not using ponds, um, but there's a question as to whether they can be economically efficient enough to compete against um, some of the cheaper imports. I'll, I'll field that one to start. Um, I mean, <clears throat> one of the big problems is that um, in a lot of these developing countries where shrimp is being produced, labor is extremely cheap, and in places where environmental regulations are not so strong, um, the whole issue of dealing with wastewater um, is not always passed on to the consumer, if you know what I'm saying. Um, it's, it's, it's a local problem. It's not a problem of the consumer. Um, that's changing. Certain places are getting tighter. Um, I certainly tried the containment grown stuff. Um, there was um, actually after this disease, the early mortality syndrome had Asia, um, I was speaking with the buyer or sort of seafood policy person at Whole Foods. And she was telling me that this farmer from Alabama who was doing some containment growing kind of stepped into the breach and um, you know, people accepted it. I, I've, I've eaten it, it's perfectly fine. 
Um, containment growing of anything is expensive. It's energy intensive. Um, you know, if you guys have heard about the aquaculture, I'm sorry, the um, genetically modified salmon. Anybody hear about that whole fight? So, you know, the main reason that that fight is being uh, made by a Massachusetts company, I should add, um, his main argument, or their main argument at Aquabounty, is that they can, by using genetic modification, they can grow a salmon so quickly that even though you're using more energy to, con to make a controlled, temperature controlled environment like, you know, a tank out of, water, out of ocean, um, because fish grow so quickly, you won't lose that price point. Um, because you know you're you're getting you're getting the, moving the creature through the system very quickly. Seems to me though, I mean, Alex, I don't know if you dealt with it, but like shrimp, they grow so quickly that as far as a containment creature, that they should work. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the price issue in that case, and I know a couple in Massachusetts uh, that are going through that, is uh, is really a convenience for the the. The, the, the purveyor's systems of where that shrimp is going to be, how that system is going to be purchased, who's going to process it, what are the customer's specifica specifications, and, and uh, where it's going to go in the, end, in the end run. Because the way the system really works on these large-scale uh, seafood vendors is uh, things are basically mass packaged and produced and shipped and have very specific specs. And whole entire industries are based on these specs. When you have a guy who comes in and says, you know, I have great, I have, I have 50 tons of shrimp I'm going to produce. Well, that seems like a lot, but when you have a producer that's producing 5 million tons, and this guy's got different specs, it really doesn't work. And they're going to say, yeah, no thanks. Um, I'll give you $7 a pound when the market's 14. Um, because right now, shrimp is at one of its all-time highs. And, yeah. you know, because uh, of the EMS, because of the disease. Right? Yeah, and, and, and so it's putting, we, we primarily source, um, actually 100% source, wild Pacific Mexican shrimp, uh, whites and browns, and it's put those uh, shrimp prices higher than we've ever seen. Yeah, you know, by far as well. So I mean, I think what is true of shrimp is that you know it's one of the most popular seafoods, partially because it's cheap, and um, well, it's also because it, it's, and it's not, delicious. And it's delicious, and it's not fishy, and you know, it's easy to cook. It's easy yeah. to cook. All these kinds of things. Uh, but I don't think historically we've really been bearing the real price of shrimp, and you know, no. with some of these disease coming, diseases coming back. I mean, talking to people in the aquaculture world who do a lot of work over in Thailand and so forth, you know, they do feel that this disease outbreak is a result of pushing the system too hard. And if you're, you know, if you're trying to meet a price point, you're going to stock your ponds more and more densely, and you know, at a certain point you're going to pay a price. I mean, it happens with all livestock. Um, you know, there are diseases that it happens come with right. oysters. It happens with oysters. Um, so. You know, you pay the piper one way or another. Yes. So because of the sort of thorniness of trying to figure out what to eat, yeah. When I eat seafood, I often stick with uh, mussels from Maine mm -hmm. or oysters from Massachusetts, and I'm wondering what are the drawbacks to those the farming of mussels and oysters? Like, is it just <laughs> <laughs> um, mus well, mussels uh, mussels grow very fast as well. Um, and usually when those beds, I mean, farmed mussels uh, will have some uh, local habit, local sort of habitat farming issues in their own right. Um, I'm more familiar with the wild mussels that we harvest in Cape Cod Bay, which are these basically massive piles that they work on in, in very small areas. Um, but as far as the oyster, um, and I know a lot of people are, are looking at the farming practices right now and trying to identify the pros and cons, but the oysters, when we say farmed oysters, we're not, um, these aren't a closed system. These are in, um, specifically in Wellfleet, they're in areas that uh, were non-productive to start with. And uh, the ha in order to get a propagation permit, you can't have anything growing there before you get this permit. So they're taking land that was not productive at all and now converting it into something that is fertile. Um, obviously, there's, there's some impacts with, with people driving trucks on the beach and having equipment out there and, and metal and, and plastic. Um, but if there's good husbandry practices uh, um, followed, uh, the result is, is, is what we've seen over the last you know, 35 years in Wellfleet, um, you know, the new modern age of, of oyster farming. It's very positive because we have animals out there that are really adding, uh, adding um, this filtration, as I was talking about, but also that substrate really adds as, um, you know, these, these sort of artificial reefs as well. And so that's creating more habitat. And that together ser serves as this big sort of ecosystem service and um, in, the, in the long run provides a, a really healthy environment. Yeah, I mean, I just briefly add, you know, with mussels, 
the only place where I've really encountered and heard about major problems was in Spain, where they actually grow so many muscles that they reached carrying capacity. In other words, there were too many muscles for the amount of phytoplankton in the water. So, and then there were some issues about waste. Um, but the biggest issue that happens with a lot of shellfish farmers is use conflict, is that you know a lot of people do not like to look at oyster farms or mussel farms. They don't want that in their quote unquote view shed. You guys might have heard about how in Mashpee, I think it was the Kraft family that owns the Patriots, you know, put in a rider, I think, to vote down an oyster farm. I mean, uh, Taylor Shellfish Farms out in the Olympic Peninsula was sued under the Clean Water Act for shellfish farming. And the, the judge threw it out, you know, it was like ridiculous. But, you know, these usage conflicts are gonna happen. Um, even fishermen, you know, fishermen, aquaculturists, the whole nature of the waterfront moving forward is like, what's the point of having a waterfront if you can't eat from it? Is it just going to become a vacation system or should it be a food system? So um, I think we're at the end. Um, so uh, I will tell you that there's, there's my context if you guys want to keep the conversation going. I, I only check Twitter and Facebook, you know, 40 or 50 times a day. So um, if I don't get back to you within a nanosecond, um, I apologize. Um, I think we have a few books to sign. Um, apologies, um, we only have four fish to sell. Um, American Catch actually is, uh, we're sort of in a transitional moment from hardcover to paperback. But um, we are selling copies of, of um, four fish. I'm happy to sign them. If, there, if we run out, you can either put an order in with the aquarium or obviously go to the Antichrist and order from Amazon. Um, but um, I didn't say that. Um, no, no. We all depend on Amazon in some way or another. So anyway, um, uh, no, you're welcome to get it whichever way you want. Um, happy to keep the conversation going. And thank you very much to the aquarium. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.